if not you, Conrad. The reading, and then uh, we're going to pray. Uh, so, scripture reading, we're going to um, read the, the second part of the parable, uh, but we'll go from verse 17. So, Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning at verse 17 and uh, through to the end of the chapter. So, it's on the screen if you want to follow it on the screen uh, or in your Bible. Uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning at verse 17 through. <coughs> To the end of the chapter. Let us hear uh, God's word. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out. And pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may, may, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. May God bless to us then that uh, portion of his word. We're going to pray before we sing again. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we come into your presence tonight and we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this open access. Thank you that we can come together. Thank you that we can come as a, a, a gathering of your, your people. Thank you that we can come before you in prayer. You are God. There is no other. You are mighty and mighty to save. And we bless your holy name tonight. We uh, long to be able to utter praises to you. Uh, we think of the words of the psalmists and we give you thanks, Lord, that they have been written down for us to respond back to you in praise. We think of the songs that we have, the psalm hymns and spiritual songs uh, that is ours to, to lay hold of and to sing. Uh, the abilities you have given men and women to crystallise uh, these words of adoration in, in such succinct form. We bless you, O oh God, for the opportunity to use music to your glory. And Father, we thank you that as we come to you in prayer, we thank you that you are a God who is not afar off. You are a God who inhabits eternity. You are a God who is infinite in all ways. 
And yet you are a God who by your Holy Spirit dwells within us. If we are in Christ this evening, then the, we are uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of Christ within us. And oh God our Father, we thank you that as we come to your word, we realise that the promises in this word are applicable to us. And we can even plead those promises tonight. And you have said, Lo, I am with you even always, even to the end of the age. Your son has said that. And we believe it to be true. We know it to be true by experience. And our God and our Father, we thank you that as we come in prayer, we can also come in praise. Because we can say thank you for uh, your goodness to us. We consider even this past week. If we were to consider all of your goodness to us even this past week, oh God, we would not have time. We would not have time to share one with another how good the Lord has been this week to us. Lord, you have kept us. You have kept us from sin. You have allowed, Lord, what you have allowed for your good plans and purposes. Your mercies have been new every day. You have provided for us. You have given to us abundantly out of your abundance. Oh God, our Father, you are so good. And yet in spite of that, we haven't served you as we ought. We haven't worshipped you as we ought. We haven't brought you glory as we ought. And in spite of your goodness to the people of this world, your name has been downtrodden, your name has been tarnished, and yet still you are merciful. Still you show your common grace to men and women. Oh God our Father, you are beyond measure. You are holy, even as we heard this morning with the children. You are set apart. You are different. And oh God and our Father, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you have made us different. There still is that uh, sin within, the residue uh, that needs dealing with and is a constant thorn in our flesh, as it were, even to the day we die. Lord, we confess we will be sinners till the day we die. And yet we also know that we are to run the race with endurance and we are to, uh, to, to be cooperative with you. And we know that you are sanctifying us and we know that you are making us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we consider this, we look to what will be, what has not yet been, but what will be. One day we will be glorified. One day we will be made perfectly holy. One day that residue of sin will be completely gone. And one day we will be given that new body. One day we will be presented faultless before the bride. And one day we will be able to have the capacity to worship you with, with in, in so much more clarity, so much more wholeheartedness, so much more energy and oneness as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for a measure of that that we can have on this earth. We thank you for a measure, a foretaste of glory divine as we sung this morning, uh, this evening at the start. But God, we recognise it's just a foretaste. We recognise uh, we do not know the half of it. The best is yet to come. And so we pray, Lord, that you would keep our eyes fixed upon this reality. Lord, we think of the Apostle Paul who said, we, we, we uh, fix our eyes not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are unseen, because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. And so our God and our Father, we thank you. You have placed eternity in our hearts. We now have eternal life. And uh, Lord, we now have a different view of things. We now see the things of this world. We now recognise, Lord, that though you have given us all good things and our lives have fallen in pleasant places, we now recognise, Lord, that our hope is not in this world, but our hope is in the risen Saviour. And we serve a risen Saviour. Oh God, our Father, please, uh, this evening as we come to consider the attitude of the elder brother, oh God, our Father, we pray that you would deal with us. And we pray, oh Lord, that we would be found to be serving you with a right attitude. Renew in us a right spirit, oh Lord. Cleanse our hearts, we ask. And our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is able to pierce the hardest of hearts. And so we pray tonight, Lord, each and every one of us in this room would be affected by your word, your Holy Spirit breathing life upon your word, speaking to us, Lord. We pray that we would be spoken to. Give us ears to hear what you would have to say to us. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. You are truth. You are good. And... Father, we thank you, you are living. You are not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And we are alive if we are in Christ, even this evening. We once were dead, but if we are in Christ, we are spiritually alive. Oh God, our Father, please, 
meet with us tonight. And uh, Lord, may we go from this place rejoicing that we have met with the living Jesus. We commit and commend our brothers and sisters who aren't here tonight, uh, those who have family responsibilities, those who are away for rest and recuperation, those who are perhaps sick and laid aside, maybe for those who perhaps whose flame has dimmed and perhaps has seen something of uh, an attraction elsewhere. Father, we pray that whatever reason you would bring us again safely together, that we would again worship you in spirit and in truth. But for us here tonight, oh God our Father, make this be a memorable meeting because you would be with us and you would manifest your presence. In your presence there is delight. We thank you, we praise you, that you are God. We thank you, we praise you for the opportunity to worship you tonight. We thank you, we praise you, that the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing, uh, or for a closer walk, uh, and then we'll come to the message. Let's stand to sing.
Okay. So the parable of the lost son, we had the start of it this morning and we were applying it to the unbeliever in as much as uh, there's, there's hope. The gospel is a gospel of hope. Uh, this evening, it's the second part of that parable. It's one parable. It's the second part of the parable and it's with re- uh, regards to the elder brother. Now, I've preached from this passage a number of times and it's always vexed me. The elder brother, uh, who is he? And... Um, well, well, we'll come to that. Uh, last Sunday night, I, I, I worshipped at uh, another church, and uh, it's always good to meet new members of the family. So when we have visitors, that's why it's ex- you know, so exciting to uh, potentially meet new members of the family, uh, although we don't take it for granted that somebody's a Christian just because they could walk through the doors. Um, but the, the man, uh, the preacher, read from this passage that uh, we read from tonight and touched upon uh, this, this passage, and uh, I felt spoken to felt helped. I wrote one or two things down and um, so uh, hopefully we'll we'll benefit tonight. Now it's the last of this series. Uh, We may return to the parables in the future, I'm not sure, but um, it's a a fitting one to to finish on. And this this chapter, it's a a chapter of joy, isn't it? Luke chapter 15. We've seen this over these last couple of weeks, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. There's this theme throughout Uh, of rejoicing, something being lost, now being found, someone being lost, now being found, someone being considered dead, now being alive, being lost, being found, and the rejoicing that accompanies that. And uh, that's the, the theme of the chapter. And again, remember the context that the Lord Jesus Christ set off on these parables Well, because he was being chastised, he was being condemned for um, uh, um, uh, for being amongst sinners. And uh, remember, then he he sets off like this is uh, this is what I've come to do. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. I haven't come for those who are healthy, healthy in their own eyes, because ultimately none of us are healthy in God's eyes. I haven't come for those who are healthy in their own eyes but for those who know they are sick. And I have come to heal, and I have come to restore, and I have come to bring life. I have come to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. And, um, you know, the, I would have loved to have listened to the Lord Jesus uh, say, give, give this uh, kind of discourse at the start. The power, that would have been there, undoubtedly. But then to consider, friends, that we... We're one of those. We uh, were uh, a sinner. We were those who were sat at his feet, listening to the one. Come here, the one who told me all that ever I did. He spoke like no man. He had authority, something attractive, something magnetic, something authoritative about him. And to have been spoken to and to have been offered salvation. Well, praise God, he still speaks today through his word. And praise God that even this this evening, the Holy Spirit can be dealing with you individually. And praise God, you can respond. And we must respond individually. It's been said, hasn't it? There's no group bookings into heaven. That said, what a day it will be when we see so many that we know in glory and for all eternity to be able to worship together. What a, a future the Christian has. And so we saw this morning the, uh, the lost son. We saw, didn't we, uh, he was stuck in the mud, uh, the long walk back, uh, the lookout, the father, who was, I'm doing actions I don't even mean to, uh, the lookout, the father, who was uh, filled with compassion and, uh, for his son, and then the uh, unfolding celebrations uh, because this lost son has been found. And so that brings us to this evening and the elder brother. And the elder brother comes in from the field, and uh, maybe it's a field a few uh, fields away from the house, uh, because he doesn't know what's going on. He can hear this music and this dance, uh, hear dancing, he can see dancing, he can hear this celebration anyway. And uh, uh, he asks, what's going on? And uh, the servant uh, is delighted uh, to be able to say, your brother has come, your lost brother He's come, and uh, because of this, your father has killed the fatted calf. 
So the father is given the lead. The father is delighted. It isn't your father has taken your son into the office and he's given him a better dressing down. It's your father has killed the fatted calf. Here's the direction we're going in as a family. The servant is delighted. He's expecting the elder brother to be delighted. Why? Because the brother who was lost has been found. How hurt they were when he left. How sad they were. How grieved they were. And so, therefore, how rejoicing this elder brother will be to think that his younger brother has come back. The elder brother, um, he's going to inherit. The younger brother has already had his share. Remember, it would have probably been about a third of the estate would have been given to the younger brother. The elder brother, all that he has in due course, uh, all that his father has in due course, will become his. His inheritance is secure. Uh, but, uh, uh, so he, but his brother coming back, well, how his father is rejoicing. And so how his brother must be rejoicing on behalf of his father. Because he would know how grieved his father would have been at what his younger brother did. And to see, his older, uh, to see his father rejoicing and thrilled, how it would have pleased the elder brother. But that's not what we find, is it? We find that this elder brother is angry. We find that he refuses to go in. He won't join in the celebration. He takes himself away from it. He, uh, we could say he has a sulk. He's petulant. He's indignant. He's cross. He's jealous. He's dissatisfied. He's certainly unhappy. This is not how he envisaged the end of his day going. And uh, his father, true to form, goes out. His father humbles himself. His father goes out to his older son. His father didn't need to do that. His father could have told him, get in. But he goes out. And he doesn't rebuke him in front of everybody. He goes and speaks to him where he's at. He meets him where he's at. And he says, you know, and he, he, he's, he pleads, we're told. Uh, in, verse, in verse 28, came out and pleaded with him. And uh, pleaded with him what? Come, join. You be the, if anything, be the, be the leader of this party. Be at the forefront of the celebration because your, your old man is happy. I was so sad and now I'm happy and come on, you've got the energy. Get dancing. Get in the center of it. Get the music started. Rejoice, your younger brother's here. Bring him in. Show him how pleased we are to see him. He pleads with him. But the elder brother, he doesn't relent. In fact, he manifests now just how deep this, this uh, grievance is. And what does he say? He says, Lo, these many, verse 29, these many years I have been serving you. And in the NIV it renders, I've been slaving for you. All of these years I've been serving you. All of these years I've been slaving for you. All of these years I've had to work hard for you. It is bitter. And as we see, what do we see? It's, there's an interesting dynamic here, isn't there? Because the, the, the son in the morning, the, the younger brother, what did he want? He said, if only I could be like a hired servant. And the hired servant, they didn't have a job contract. It would have been pays you, you know, on the day. If it's a work for you, right, I'll take you for the day. And because of that, there's no responsibilities. But they have no claim upon any estate. Literally, they're just paid, cash in hand, day, a day's wage. And because of that, remember in John 10, when Jesus talks about the hired hand who will flee when a wolf comes uh, to, to look after sheep, the hired hand, the hireling, the one who looks after shepherd on a day rate, when a wolf comes, whoa, I'm not paid for this, off I go. I don't really care about this flock, I'm just here for the day. I'm supply, I'm a stand-in. And so the, the, the younger brother this morning said, if only I could be treated even like a hired hand. I'd be in a better position than I am right now. And of course, his father puts, on the, the, puts him on the, the robe, the ring, the sandals. In other words, you're my son. I'm having nothing of this. You are my son. And he gives him and he says to everybody, this is my son. He gives him his place. But then when we come to the elder son, who is the elder son? He is the one who's going to inherit this 
place. Everybody knows it. He's secure. Everybody looks on and says, that's the one, you know, be good to him because when the old man goes, he's going to be our boss. That's the one and they know it. Everybody knows it. But look how he speaks to his father. He speaks to his father as though he's a hired hand. I've been slaving for you. I've been working for you. He speaks as though he has no, there's no personal um, uh, warmth between the two. He speaks as though he is just a hired hand. He's mercenary. Can we put it like that? He's mercenary about it. He's not thinking about the fact that if he works hard at the business, then obviously he takes on a good and thriving concern. He's not thinking about the fact that he wants to help his dad. He's not thinking about the fact that we do it for the family. He's thinking merely about himself. So you can see, it's an interesting contrast, isn't it? This elder brother is speaking as though he's a hired hand himself. What does he say about his brother? He then goes on to say, um, well, let's, let's, let's we've jump ahead. I never transgressed your commandment. He said, I've never, I've never, I've never disobeyed you. Uh, there's this self-righteousness there, isn't there? I've never put a foot wrong. Well, okay, neither should you have done. But I've, I've, never, I've never stepped out of line. I've, I've served you. I've slaved for you. And you never so much as, and it's a bit petty, isn't it? You never even gave us a fatted goat so I could make merry with my friends. Oh, poor fella. This... We know the character of the father. Would the character have been a hard task? Would the father have been a hard taskmaster? No. Is the father generous? Yes. Would the son have been looked after? Yes, of course. This is just jealousy, isn't it? And then he shows his attitude. So he shows his attitude to his father. He shows his attitude to himself. He shows his attitude to his brother. And uh, I know many of us have picked this up over the years. Uh, when this son of yours, verse 30... How did the servant in the first place refer to, uh, to, the, to the brother coming back? Your brother has come back. Everybody knew it. Your brother. And how does the father refer to it? Your brother has come back. And later on he says again, your brother. How does the brother refer to the fella? This son of yours. He dissociates himself, doesn't he? He isolates himself. He separates himself. His attitude, you see. And what does he say about this son? Well, he says, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this son of yours who has squandered your property with harlots, with prostitutes. Now, unless news has travelled fast, he doesn't know what the son has done. He may well be right. He probably did. But there's no, there's no just as the father this morning, uh, and at that time, went to the younger son and, and embraced him and as it were, remember, covered his shame. What's the, what's the elder brother doing? He's highlighting, he's finger pointing at the shame. He's naming the worst things. There are some things that are shameful to be named. There are some things that we, we not put, uh, sweep under the carpet, but there are some things that we kind of draw a veil over. But he doesn't, he, he's airing this dirty laundry. He doesn't care who he is it. This son of yours has squandered your possessions and he's made out with harlots, with prostitutes. And you've killed the fatted calf for him? What's his attitude to his father? Well, he's questioning his father now. If I was the one in, in charge of this business, there is no way I would do that. So rather than taking his father's lead and going and joining in the celebrations and heading up the celebrations, now he's beginning to say, you've done the wrong thing. You're, you're, you're off on this one. Your attitude, your, your, what you've done is wrong. Why have you killed the fatted calf for this one? You shouldn't have done it. So his attitude to his father isn't right, is it? Yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the father's response? And again, you see, we sort of see with the father this loving response. He says in verse 31, 32, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. But it was right that we should make merry and be glad. 
For your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. The father isn't budging, is he? But the father's so gracious and so tender. Right. What's that got to do with us? You see, the thing is, if we put the elder brother as uh, perhaps the Jew, and we say, well, uh, that's to do with the gospel going from the Jew to the Gentile, well, that, we kind of step out of it then. Not much application to us. Or if we put the elder brother as these Pharisees and tax collectors, well, none of us here really want to uh, identify ourselves as a Pharisee and a tax collector. They're not flavor of the month, really, are they, in church circles? So again, we kind of separate, say, well, absolutely, I'll, I'll um, abs absent myself from, from uh, the application here tonight. I'm not like that. And if we say that the elder brother is, a, is, an, is unconverted, then, well, I'm naming the name of Christ and I'm a Christian. So that's, again, there's not much doing here for me tonight. So who is the elder brother? Whew. Let's make a start. <laughs> me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can see me there far too easily. What's the problem with the elder brother? The problem with the elder brother is his attitude. Never mind his position. Never mind if he's a believer or an unbeliever. For the moment, that sounds a bit dodgy. Never mind that for the moment. What's his attitude? Let's, this is a snapshot of his attitude, of his heart, at this point in time. If somebody was to take a snapshot of, our atti of the attitude of our heart at this time, what would it be? And there's three things here that strike out that we've already discussed, but we'll just draw on a little bit more of why his attitude is not good. His attitude to himself. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter rather, uh, says in 2 Peter 1, um, he goes to say, doesn't he, for this reason, make every effort to add to 2 Peter 1 verses 5, uh, 6 and 7. There's this list uh, that you're to add to. In other words, progressing in the faith. There's no standing still. It's like on an escalator going the wrong way. You've got to keep going. There's no standing still in the Christian life. If you're standing still, you're going backwards. So add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, so on and so forth. And then it leads to this crescendo of this knowledge, this experiential knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Christian is to grow in experience of Jesus. Somebody says, I've become a Christian. Great, that's the start. You, you mean there's more? Oh boy, there's a lot more. There's the Lord Jesus to know about and to experience and enjoy. And when does it end? Well, actually, it then starts again in eternity. And for all of eternity, we'll be able to sing worthy as the Lamb. Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. He's God. But if you don't, if we don't grow as a Christian, if we don't grow in these characteristics, verse 9 of 2 Peter 1, if anyone, but, but if anyone does not have them, in other words, if anyone has stood still, if anyone has settled, if anyone has begun to think, well, it's Christian life, I've got my ticket. If anyone does not have them, he is short-sighted and blind. And listen to this, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. This elder brother had the wrong attitude about himself. He was thinking, he was, say, he was saying, and I've never stepped out of line. Christian, we can get, if you're a non-Christian, you have a wrong attitude to yourself. You know, it's amazing how self-righteous non-Christians can be. You knock on a door and you say about the need for salvation, and they say, yes, but I'm not as bad as that fella down the road. But it doesn't go away when you become a Christian. You know, we stand at the start of the service, and I think we've got the order just about right. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And there are those moments, isn't there, when you just go, oh, yes, that's right. And then that awareness of how deep the Father's love for us, the next song we sung. And you're just lost in this, this sense of God's love. But there are those moments in the Christian life where you go, where is the blessedness that once I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? What's happened? I've gone a bit dry here. That's the, that's the life of the Christian, isn't it? That's the testimony, the reality of the Christian. And what happens then? Well, 
we can become to be a little bit dry, or we begin to become a little bit cold. We cool off, and we begin to think that maybe in this Christian life, we begin to forget what it was like when we weren't a Christian. We begin to forget the reality of what it was like when we came to Jesus as a sinner, what it was like when we came with nothing in our hands, and we simply pleaded on the mercy of Jesus Christ. And it's almost as though sometimes it's like we could become a Christian and it's like almost as though we begin to take over from here. I can't manage, I can't manage, I can't manage. I'll save you. Oh, but now I'll manage, I'll take it on my own from now. And we almost begin to get a little self-sufficient. And we almost begin to think somehow in our minds that we've somehow done something to save ourselves. As though we've almost contributed to our salvation as though we've almost, almost as though we deserve to be saved. We wouldn't say it out loud, but we begin to think it a little bit. We begin to think, yes, I probably do deserve to go to heaven. I would look in the mirror and I would see what grace has been doing, but I would begin to think, well, I've done it, forgetting that it's the Spirit that's, been, that's done it from start to finish. And we begin to think and look and go, well, actually, I don't shape up too bad. And then, so we've got an inflated view of ourselves. Self-righteousness begins to creep in. And we begin then, it affects how we look at others. Now remember, and we t- tackled the parable, didn't we? The parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember the Pharisee gave it large when he was praying, but he looked down his nose at the, at the tax collector. Oh, friends. When we see the person in the gutter. When we see, hear the person blaspheming. When we see that person who, it seems to all intents and purposes, is godless. Oh, how easily it is. How easily we can sink into that slight sneer at them. How easy it is. And it's a fine line because is, should there be a righteous anger at sin? Absolutely. Should we look on that person and pity that person? What sin has done to that person? Yes, absolutely. But we should never for one moment... Forget that there go I, but for the grace of God. So the attitude to ourselves, it begins to inflate. We lose a little bit of reality about what we are. We begin to think somehow we've contributed to our salvation. Somehow we deserve uh, that salvation. And then our attitude to others. Just as the elder brother, his attitude to his his. Uh, younger brother was horrendous so too sometimes our attitude to others no it doesn't just have to be the attitude to the person who's in the street so to speak this manifests itself in our attitude to our brothers and sisters in Christ and how easily our attitude can worsen to our brothers and sisters in Christ And praise God for the reality of scriptures, the earthiness of it, the truthfulness of it. Because we find, don't we, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, I plead with the odia. Not Yoda. I plead with the odia. And I plead with Syntyche. Get on in the work. Get on. And we're instructed, aren't we, to keep the unity, not make the unity. We can't make unity. We're united in Christ. He's our unity. But we are to keep the unity. We are to guard the unity. And you only have to look at the history of the Christian church to see how a secondary issue has been put above unity. Schism. So there has been separation, oftentimes, over somebody's personal peccadillo. Their their, uh, attitude to something. And Christ hasn't been first. Unity hasn't been first. Now, does that mean we should allow heresy in? Does that mean we shouldn't watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing? No, absolutely. But that doesn't mean to say we then go to the other extreme and we become an island and we, we, we keep at arm's length everybody else. No, the only right ground is on Christ, looking to Christ. And it's a balance. And there's error there, there's error there, there's danger there, there's danger there. We have to be balanced. And so we're aware that we have, to, we have to be doctrinally on the right track as, as, as much as possible. We, we ask the Lord to help us to rightfully divide the word of God. Absolutely. 
but equally so, the unity of the church. I think of, is it George Whitfield who said, I love all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, not only on doctrinal issues, it can be on personality issues. It seems with Yodia and Syntyche, it was personality issues. Well, we're all of us different. And no one personality type should dominate a church. No one family should dominate a church, a local church. Has it happened in the past? Of course it has. Church history, this is why it's helpful. The great Jonathan Edwards was booted out of his church because of a family, because he took a right stand, and this family, and there was loads of them in the family, they took umbrage, and they kicked him out. So there's reality. This happens, you see. So we have to guard our hearts towards our brother and our sister. What does Paul tell us to? He tells us to submit one to another. What does that mean? Does that mean we just go agreeing with everybody? No, no, but it means that we, uh, we think the best. We seek to purposefully try and think the best. There's a 50-50. We can decide whether to take offence at it or that we can decide uh, to, to try and think the best of it. We go and we try and think the best of it. There's something that somebody's done. We can either dwell upon it, stew upon it, uh, re resuscitate, uh, mull it over, or we can try and just let love cover that multitude of sins. There's a wrong that's done. We can either get the, fist, uh, the, the sleeves rolled up, ready to, 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 to be uh, angry and cross, or we can seek to have a forgiving spirit, always willing to forgive. You see the elder brother, he just had a bad attitude to his, to his younger brother, didn't he? He had a bad attitude. And friends, we have to guard our attitude. Now, there are those who would say, never mind, uh, the other sheep in the church is between me and Jesus. Oh dear. No, he's been saved into the church. That's not our choice. You haven't a choice. You can't choose your family. We've been saved into the church. And uh, we have a high view, don't we, of the local church. Uh, this church, we welcome anybody visiting. It's an open public meeting, and we welcome any. And, and when people are visiting from holiday, on holiday, it's great. And, and if people decide that they're, they're the church that they're attending, for whatever reason, it's important what those reasons are, but okay, then we, 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 you will come into membership at due course and be welcomed, as it were. But now this is, we're to stick together, we're to, we're to work together, we're to labor together, we're to uh, share. And it would be very easy to become very distant, so we can't see any problems. But no, no, we, we're not called to do that. We're called to labor together, to help each other, for iron to sharpen iron, to be a helpmeet to one another on this road, uh, the Christian journey. And there are those then who will, who will be weeping, and we're to weep with those who weep. There will be those who are rejoicing, and we're to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. There will be those who are idle, and they need to be prodded gently, but said, come on work there are those who are weak and they need teaching so come on learn about this let me instruct you there will be the older woman taking alongside the younger woman but all with this spirit of grace not with a superiority not with a view of i know more than you but with this sense of i've been taught this is what the lord has taught me let me share this is only of grace that I've got anyway. What gifts I have, I can't boast in these gifts. It's what God has given to me. And I'm more than happy to rejoice in the gifts that you have been given. I don't feel threatened by those gifts. I don't take umbrage. I'm not jealous. I rejoice in the fact that God has gifted you. And I'm praying that God would rejoice, it would gift more people in the church. And that those gifts would come out and be, and be, and be uh, encouraged and uh, nurtured and that those gifts would grow and that those and that God would use and there's somebody being used to bring somebody to salvation I'm not jealous I praise God because the father is being pleased the father is being lifted up you see we can't separate our attitude to each other from our attitude to the father because the man's attitude the elder brother's attitude to the younger brother showed what his attitude was to his father there he should have been leading the celebration. He should have been rejoicing for the sake of his father. The old man has, has got back his son. He should have seen that. Instead he was thinking about himself. So our attitude one to another impacts our attitude to our father. So if our attitude one to another isn't right, then our attitude to our father isn't right. And so what of our attitude to our father? Oh... 
Do we think, do we look on in the world and see what they're enjoying? And there's a little bit of jealousy. Do we think about what the Lord allows in our life and we think, and we just kind of have a, a cultural stiff upper lip and stoic attitude? Do we secretly get annoyed at the fact that he's allowing certain things in lives? Do we harbour resentments? Think of the prophet Jonah, for those who've been in growth groups, and Jonah's attitude towards God. We wouldn't perhaps vocalise these things, but are are there little embryos of that attitude in our hearts? You see, this brought it out. This episode brought it out. I've been slaving for you. Do we think the Christian life is one of servitude? Do we think that we're limited by following Jesus? Or how easily that grain can creep in? Is it a hardship to come to the meetings? Is it it too much to put ourselves out to share to others about Jesus? I put these things out. We will have, if we search our hearts, we will have little things in our hearts that we think, ah, okay, maybe the Spirit now will just prompt and think, yep, that's, there's a... Is it too much for, the, for Jesus to be Lord of our life? I want salvation. I want to worship you. But I want to have this in my life. This I have to have me time. I have to have this in my life. That's not yours. Do any of us have that? Well, if truth be told, as we grow on in the Christian life, it's like layers. We'll begin to see things that are true about us that we never realized before. And that's progression. So what do we do? What do we do if we begin to think, My attitude to my brother or sister. My attitude to myself. My attitude to my God. There's something askew here. What do we do? Three R's. We recognise it. We don't sweep it under the the carpet. It makes the carpet bumpy. And it's not going to go away. We maybe, I don't know, like later. Say again. Okay, that's my third point. Don't, don't steal me thunder. The first one, recognize. Recognize that there's something wrong. Now, when he came to his senses this morning, the younger son, was it painful when he recognized that the, the position he was in? Of course it was. It is, isn't it? When the Christian is convicted and realized that there's something about themselves that is not right and needs to be put right, It's not pleasurable. It's painful. And we can be so good at squirming out of it. We can be convicted and we can blame somebody else. We can can fudge it. It is so easy. It can be done so easily because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But if we just recognize, if literally, instead of being like a chicken that's an individual who's trying to catch and cannot catch if we're like uh, another animal uh, uh, never mind that but if we can be herded by God if we can be cornered if we can allow God's word to corner us and allow God's word to shine a spotlight upon us and allow God the Holy Spirit to convict us and to show us if we can just keep still and recognize and before him own it The first R, recognize. The second R, repent. And it's painful, but it's, oh, the only way is up. We turn. And just as that younger son had a long walk back, sometimes to to repent of these attitudes, it is painful and it can take a while but surely, if Christian, as Christians, we know the outcome, don't we? Because do we not know that our God is a forgiving God? We preach it, we share it, we tell it. Do we believe it? So what do I do? I repent. I go to him. I have no excuses. 
I, have, I am not ducking. I am not diving. I am owning it. I am recognizing it. I'm saying, God, I cannot believe this. But this bitterness or this uh, envy or this uh, uh, wrong view of self or wrong view of you is true of me. And I hate it about myself. But there we are. You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? I go to you. That's the second R. And friends, what happens when we go in repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ? Does he forgive? Can he forgive? Do we believe in the efficacy of the blood of Christ? In other words, is he still able to make the foulest clean? Is he still able to wash us clean? Do we believe the promise? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we still believe that David of Psalm, 53, of Psalm 51, where he asked God to create in him a, a clean heart and restore to him, do, do we still believe that God can do that in our life? So in faith, in repentance and faith, we trust him. And the third R is we rejoice. Because we're all works in progress. Who's the finished article here? And if somebody thinks of the finished article, get to the back of the queue. Because we are works in progress. And the more we progress, the more we see. We should have an ever-ascending view of God. Yes, and an ever-descending view of ourselves. In me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So more and more, I can see this attitude. I can see seeds of the attitude. Of, 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 uh, of a wrong attitude to my brother or sister, to myself, uh, to my father. What do I do? I deal with it. And I go looking for it. Why? Because I want to grow. I want to become more like Jesus. And because, now this is the crux, what is this chapter all about? <laughs> Joy. <laughs> Rejoicing. God rejoicing over one sinner that repents. The angels, in the, 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 there's rejoicing in the presence of angels. God leading the rejoicing. The angels looking on and rejoicing with God. The whole of, 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 of the heavenly realm rejoicing over a sinner that repents. Turning away from sin and turning to God. And friends, when we turn from sin, when we turn to God afresh in only a small thing, there's joy. And when we defeat sin in Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yet not I, but Christ in me. When we begin to go to Christ afresh and have this vital Christianity, which means that we're alive today, which means those attitudes are trodden upon, which means that we have this softness, this warmth, this vitality. When we become more and more like Christ and have the attitude of Christ, let this mind be in you that was in Christ. When we have this humility of ourselves, we think of ourselves as nothing. We see the best in the other people. We recognize that God is God and that he is true. Let every man be a liar, but God is good. And when we see those things in our life more and more, despite what we're going through or because of what we're going through, God working together all these, for all these things, for our good, for our benefit, so that we grow, what happens? Heaven rejoices. Because we're progressing in the Christian faith. And we rejoice because this is life. To become more like Jesus, this is life. Is there anything better to become like your Savior? There is nothing better than to become more like Jesus. Who doesn't want to be like Jesus when we see his life, when we look at him, when we gaze upon him with the eye of faith, when we look at his life in the Gospels, when we see Christ-likeness in other people, who wants it? We want it, don't we? With our whole heart, we want to be more like Jesus. And so, with the three R's, we recognize, we repent, we rejoice, and we can enter into this joy. We can enter into this joy. The joy of the Lord then is our strength, and we're strengthened. Uh, one theologian puts it like this. Uh, Christian joy is a good, don't be too picky in, in, in words, there's no definition that's perfect, if you think you can do better, stand up and say, Christian, actually don't write a letter on a postcard, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. That's pretty good. The point is, we're no longer a block of ice, we're like a three bar uh, fire. Uh, the point is, there's this warmth, 
The point is, people want what we've got. The point is, we want what we've got. We're not speaking to others and trying to convince ourselves. This is born out of our experience. This is, the, this is a living reality. This joy inexpressible, expressible and inarticulate, uh, unspeakable. This joy inexpressible, full of glory. This is what we have. This is what you can have. This is what we are in Christ. This is what we worship God with. This joy, this rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. What about when we go through a difficult period? Yes. Sometimes it's a deep joy. But not so deep that it can't be found. Uh, I'm pinching this phrase from last week. Uh, the minister, uh, he said, we're not to be joy takers, but joy givers. It's not my phrase, but I like it, so I'm repeating it. The elder brother was a joy taker because of his attitude to his brother, to himself, to his father. How many times, through a critical spirit, through a sharp retort, through an ill thought, through impatience, how many times have we been joy takers? You can have a church, you can have a building, can't you? That's warm. Doors are left open, it soon cools down. You can have a vibe within a, a fellowship of saints, but it's soon cooled when we leave the door open. We each of us have a responsibility in this. And we want to be. Don't we want to contribute to the life of the church? What a contribution to be joy givers. What a contribution to be following the way of the Father. What a contribution to be worshipping and to be lost in wonder, love and praise. Perfect, the finished article, beyond reproach. No, not a bit of it. Who is? That's not realistic. With this side of eternity, that side of eternity, totally different thing. But this side of eternity, we are still works in progress. Oh, but friends, you know what is said about warm spaces? People are doing warm spaces, aren't they? Uh, heating bills and so on, so let's have a warm space that people can come in and get a warm. That's good. But wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> if these church meetings were spent Spiritual warm places. Somebody coming off the street would come in and they would feel the love of God. Well, what's stopping us? <laughs> I can do all things through Christ, but only Christ who strengthens us. In me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. I'm not looking within, I'm looking without. And I'm again, as it were, being converted all over again. That experience of the younger brother is mine, maybe not as dramatically, but is mine many times in the day. I'm guilty. I own it. I'm sorry about it. But godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. And as we together help each other in this Christian journey, iron sharpening iron, recognizing we're all of us works in progress, be kind to every Christian you meet because they're in a battle. And there's an evil one who will try and sow discord. There's an evil one who will whisper. There's an evil one who, will, who is dedicated to your downfall. Yet praise God, greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And Jesus Christ has promised, I will build my church. So if this is our desire, we're desiring the same as him. And in our prayers accordingly, he will give us all that we stand in need of. Who is sufficient? No one. But his grace is sufficient. Look at the father's attitude to the elder brother. Does it strike you? He just continues to be gracious, doesn't he? This is our God. Even when we are 
shriveled prunes in our ways with one another. Even when we do let the door open, even when we let the cold in, even when we drop a clangor, even then we, when we use by the evil one, yet God is still gracious towards us. What a God we serve. Let's sing uh, in closing. I once was lost in darkest night. It thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy.